All right. Welcome to Protecting Our Pollinators, a live virtual event. Thank you all for joining us this evening. This event is hosted by the Carmel Clay Public Library and is part of our Citizen Science Month of Programs and Events, which is just now winding down, but you can find out more about all of the fun activities the library has planned throughout the month of April, including our new Citizen Science Kits that you can check out by visiting us online at carmelclaylibrary.org. And this evening, I'm so pleased to introduce our guest speaker, Holly Faust an interpretive naturalist with the Hamilton County Parks and Recreation who will be sharing very useful information on pollinators and how we can help them thrive. We ask that you do please hold all questions until after Holly's presentation where we will hold a Q&A session. And Holly, I'm gonna pass it off to you. Hello, thank you for having me. I appreciate it, it's quite an honor. Um, I've given this talk a lot of times over the years, uh, I got on native pollinators because I originally uh, started out with having um, Wow, sorry, hang on a minute here. Well, that's weird. Anyway, I started looking into honeybees and um, and I was like, oh, cool, I might just, uh, you know, do honeybees. And then I started to realize that, oh my gosh, honeybees are not native. And I'm trying to figure out how to share the screen here. Uh, shouldn't be. Hmm. There should be a, a green button on the bottom yeah. of the screen that says share screen with a box with an up arrow. Yeah, okay, now it says one participant can share at a time. Is that what I check on? Let's see, um, when you click on share screen, uh -huh. um, a box should pop up and it would have a desktop um, or a PowerPoint in there. Okay, let's see here. Uh, oh boy. No, it shouldn't be that. Hmm. And when you click on the share screen button, make sure you're clicking right in the middle and not on the little up arrow to the right. Okay, let me go back then. Um, the green arrow, correct? And right smack in the middle? Yes. Okay. Uh, no, I don't want to do that either. Sorry about that. I think I have too many windows open. I wonder if I should just shut them all except the PowerPoint. That might help. Yeah. All right. Sorry about that. Well, shoot. That's Zoom. Okay. Okay. There's that. Now. Okay, shut down my Outlook. And is this it? Nope, that was not it. I'll get rid of that. Huh. Well, um, did I lose you? We're, we're still here. We're, you're off video. You can also, if you want to email me that presentation, I can share that for you as well. Okay. Cause I know, let's see, I did it with someone else and, oh, what about this? Aha, there it is. Okay. I think we got it. I see it. Slideshow, current slide. Aha, uh -huh. here we go. Is that, do you, is that what you guys see the whole thing now? We're good to go. Yay, all right. So, <clears throat> sorry, as I was saying, <laughs> I've had smoother transitions and then, well, you know, it happens, it's um, technology. 
So I got interested in honeybees and I said, wait a minute. I found out, I said, they're not native, not to North America at all. Um, so then I went, well, okay, if the European honeybees aren't native, what are native pollinators? And that's the row that I started on. And that's when I've, I've just, I've not got off it yet. So this is going to be the buzz about pollinators. Um, basically pollinators are animals that carry pollen from one plant to another. Uh, it's a mutualistic relationship. It benefits the flower and it benefits, of course, the pollinators. They're responsible for a lot of our food and flowers. And there are some biologists that believe that humans would actually not exist very long without plenty of pollinators on Earth. And we are talking about our native pollinators. We need them because they uh, can do a lot of pollinating that honeybees cannot because they're not native. Um, Honeybees have been here uh, while well, they were brought over here in the 17th century. Let me go ahead and click on this. Oh, there's our little guy. That was our little squash bee. I'll show you what one looks like. Your, uh, if my arrow shows up. This is the male flower on the squash plant. Um, a lot of us grow squash, pumpkins, uh, cucurbits are also called. And this is the female and it takes the bee to go down in here. The flower offers nectar Nectar is the energy drink of the insect world. And when they're in there getting their nectar, they get the pollen brushed on them. The flowers have grown to do this. Then they go over to the female flower. In this case, we have male and female flowers and squash flowers. And when they're getting more nectar over there, uh, they brush that pollen off on this stigma, uh, this yellow area right here on the female part. And then you it's been fertilized and then you get your beautiful squash. And here's our little squash bees, uh, native squash bees, cute little tiny little things. See these right here? Um, if you can see my arrow, these are what they can collect large amounts of pollen on. They also, the pollen brushes off on their little bellies and their little fur, because they're all, they're all furry and they're real cute. And you can see the shiny nectar down here uh, in the squash plant. So real quick, I think most everybody knows, think back to your basic biology and your botany classes, um, that a perfect flower has both male and female parts. And your male parts, of course, is the stamen, which you have the pollen on the end of the anther, and it's attached with the filament. And then the female part is the pistil, and the top is the stigma, the style, and the ovaries where the seeds grow. And if it gets pollinated, um, those little tubes grow down and then you get uh, pollination, you get your seeds. And then here's what they look like, your squash flowers after the female has been pollinated and the male uh, is done. So she just grows and she takes a lot of energy from the plant. This right here is a little wildflower that's out right now. <clears throat> I love to show this one, um, it's spring beauty. And it's a real fun one because it's got pink pollen. It's one of the few plants that has pink pollen and it has both male and female parts. But this flower does not want to self-pollinate. It So what it does is that in the flower, right in the middle there, you've got the top, the middle, and the bottom. This one right here, the male anthers are doing their thing, they're producing pollen. And so will the bee, the pollinators down in there slurping up that nectar, they get, they get pollen on them. And then they fly over to the flower at the bottom all the anthers are laying down. Well, at that point, the flower is saying, okay, the pistol's ready, the female part's ready, I'll take some pollen. And they want to do that because they don't want to self-pollinate and that's a genetic um, uh, variability is very important. Like we don't want to marry our cousins and brothers and sisters and things like that. Uh, I, oh, I'm not going to talk about that today. We're going to skip over that. Okay, so then the next thing when I was making this, um, I thought, well, why do we care? What do we care about pollinators for? So well, all these bunch of little bugs, you know, most people don't understand bugs. And I know that I had a time where I was like that. And you're like, I don't care. Well, 90% of all plant species are pollinated by animals. That's a lot of plants. And the plants that aren't pollinated by animals, and remember insects are animals, um, they are wind pollinated and a very teeny, 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 tiny, tiny percent is water pollinated. Um, yeah, if we had to rely on the water pollinated ones, we'd die really quick. <laughs> but um, the wind pollinated, those are the ones that the scientists are thinking that maybe we could survive on. 
we'd have some pretty bland diets because your wind pollinated is your wheat, um, corn, um, your grains basically. So out of all of animals, 2000 species of animals are pollinators, that's a lot. And 1000 of those species of animals are vertebrates, which remember your biology, that means you got a backbone. The rest are insects, which are of course invertebrates. 75% of our crop plants worldwide are pollinated by animals. And this includes our fruits and veggies. And sometimes in the fruits and veggies, it's not so much um, to get the fruit, but it's to have the seed. So at some point you need the fruit, whether we eat the fruit or we need the fruit to you know, uh, dry out and get the seeds so we can plant the seeds to get more fruits and veggies. Um, our, uh, sorry, fibers, I'm so used to looking at people and not this little tiny hole. <laughs> Uh, our fibers come from pollinators, and here's an example of cotton. Uh, a lot of our beverages, uh, chocolate, no pollinators, no chocolate. I know, that right there, I'm like, okay, I'm in. <laughs> um, you've got coffee, uh, your teas, etc. cetera. Uh, condiments is another one. People love their tomato, their ketchup, their mustard, their mayonnaise, their relishes, all that stuff. And... Um, this was an interesting picture because on the mayonnaise, I almost didn't include it because I went, well, wait a minute, tomato, you know, ketchup, tomatoes, mustard, okay, the seed from the mustard plant, pickle relish, pickles. Um, but I found out mayonnaise has soybean oil and, uh, or it uses other oils that very often need pollinators to get those seeds, to get those oils out of that. Also our flavorings. Hot dogs taste pretty darn good. Trust me, it's not so much the meat as it is the seasonings in those hot dogs that make them so good. And then medicines. And we don't even know right now, I mean, all of the plants that are out there that could offer medicinal purposes that we could turn into medications. And some are being discovered, you know, in just the last five years or 10 years. Uh, a perfect example of that will be coming up and I'll talk about that when we get to it. So, excuse me, one out of every three bites of food that we eat in beverages we drink come from a pollinator. Think about what you had to eat today. Is it anything you had to eat like for breakfast, lunch, dinner, snacks? Is it on this list? If we didn't have our pollinators, you wouldn't have been eating that today. It's an awful lot of things. You can see the fruit crops, the vegetables, the herbs and the spices, uh, nut crops, oil seed crops, so there's quite a bit, quite a bit going on there. I'll just do this really quick because I know I'm limited to an hour. I want to be a good host. Um, so the largest producer of almonds in the world is California. And as you guys well know, California is going through a horrible drought. They've had a little bit of relief, but they are hurting. And when they, normally when we plant crops, um, we don't do like we used to, which they, some people are going back to that. We normally plant one type of plant. We wanna wipe out everything else and it's called a monoculture. So with the almonds, they grow all these huge groves of almond trees and the climate is right in California. That's why it's done there. And well, when all those things come into bloom, they've gotta be pollinated. Well, there's a problem. You've wiped out all of your rows of um, natural plants um, like they used to use on uh, uh, farms that were more local. They would have fence rows and um, uh, sometimes they'd put rows between their plants and just let natural wildflowers grow. And that's where your natural pollinators would be and they'd come and do the job for free. Well, when you've got a monoculture like in this example, the almonds, they're like, uh, okay, these need to be pollinated. It's too much for a human to go around and do it. It'd be way too expensive. And so they have to get the honeybees and they have to get honeybees from all over the country of the United States, as far east as the Atlantic Ocean, all those states over there. 
they have to go all the way down to Florida and um, on up, up north into Minnesota, et cetera. So you get the idea. So all these bees have to be stacked up on trucks, these honeybee hives, and they are very expensive and they pay the beekeepers and the beekeepers, you know, they're getting paid, but it's not the best case scenario. Think about when a lot of people crowded into smaller places, diseases and sicknesses, they pass pretty quick, they right through the population. Plus, that's a long trip, the farther away from California you are. So anyway, that's a lot of bees and it's very expensive. They get trucked all the way to California. They set them out in the groves. The bees come out, they pollinate, they gotta get them back uh, because once those almond trees are done being pollinated, uh, the flowers die, of course, back and the bees don't have anything to eat. So it's like, okay, get these little guys home. And it, it's a mess, it's a mess. Uh, so what some almond growers are doing now, which is kind of neat in favor of our um, native pollinators, some of them are putting in these so-called fence rows or rows where you grow native wildflowers. Um, some of them, they have science, our lovely science, which I do love science. I used to be a science teacher. Um, we have also developed an almond tree that does not have to be pollinated. It self-pollinates, so it doesn't need pollinators. So the almond growers are being careful, but some of them are starting to change their ways, which is great. Okay, so this is awesome. This is Whole Foods. You guys are probably familiar with Whole Foods. And this is what Whole Foods did. Uh, it was called, um, I'm trying to remember, the Buzz, I think, the Buzz. Um, So they said, well, let's take everything out of our produce section that um, gets pollinated by pollinators. So in other words, if you need pollinators to have it, then we have to take it out. So it's kind of like, a, I do this with the kids, a bee-free picnic or um, a bee-free barbecue. And um, so they took everything out. So what you see it's left is it's been developed, it's maybe been genetically modified where they won't need pollinators to have this. Um, oranges are one, I know I read about, uh, I'm trying to think of the term, I apologize, but they, they self-pollinate, they don't need a pollinator. So they've developed an orange tree that does that. And um, so that's kind of helpful. Um, share the buzz, that's what it's called. So it's kind of uh, scary looking. You want your produce and that's all you've got to pick from. All right, you guys can breathe. We put everything back. <laughs> then several years later, another Whole Foods said, you know what, that was pretty cool. <clears throat> of course, Share the Buzz is ongoing and will be. So they said, uh, let's, let's do it in our dairy section. You think dairy section, you know, well, milk comes from cows. Well, cows have to eat and cows eat a lot of alfalfa and alfalfa is pollinated by pollinators. Um, so you don't feed those cows, you don't get your milk and plus you're gonna lose your berries and your fruits and all that that get put in a lot of these dairy products. So there's what your shelves would look like without pollinators and that yogurt down there that you're looking at, I like that brand, that's plain, it's not vanilla because you wouldn't have vanilla either. You've got to have pollinators for that. So kind of not so good. I'll put it back. Okay, you don't have to panic. <laughs> it's okay. So there's your dairy choices with bees. And then another Whole Foods said, let's take this another step one more time. Let's do the bakery. And oh my gosh, the bakery, really not much left. Most everything that is left had to be altered. It was just, it was crazy, crazy, crazy. We're talking, now we have no chocolate. Oh, this was Fremont, California that did this in 2016 in April. 97% of your bakery choices were gone. The 3% that were left were, they had to alter the recipes big time um, to get, to get a product. And you can see some of those um, tarts and those so-called cakes, 
they have got nothing on them. It's like, whoa. So yeah, pretty scary stuff. They said the only thing that was unaltered was soy-based vegan cheesecake and coconut macaroons. And I was like, hmm, okay. <clears throat> okay, it's all right. Your bakery's back to normal. So who are the pollinators? Um, the most common, as you can see in the top of the slide, bees of all sizes. And then as you go down, uh, we'll hit each one of these quickly from the most common to the least common. But you've got butterflies, moths, flies, another fly like insects, beetles, hummingbirds, ants, snails, bats, and even small reptiles and mammals. So pretty cool. I think I, yes, I think I hit all the categories. Every time I turn around, I find a new category and I'm like, oh my God, that is so cool. So bees, we have 4,000 different native species of bees in North America. And I say in counting, well, we've We've been counting backwards instead of forward. Um, we've not discovered all the species to begin with. And now the ones, a lot of the ones we do know about, they're disappearing. Uh, very scary. Um, in the world, there's about 20,000 known bee species in the world. So it's a lot of bees, a lot of bees. The majority of native bee species, about 75% nest in the ground. And you've got your cute little female tawny mining bee. She's a tiny little thing. She would fit on your pinky fingernail if after it was trimmed. <laughs> and there's what her little hole might look like. And there she is, and she's a little soft little thing. I have pet, I have petted, um, I do this with the kids and the adults. I'll take them outside and I'll pet the bumblebees and any native species that are around. Unfortunately, three, four, five years ago, we got honeybees here and I don't find any natives to pet anymore. So that's not a good thing. You got bumblebees over here. They're, they're actually, you know, like an abandoned mouse nest or something like that in the ground. But yeah, you can see your little gal, one of your little gals right here. See how tiny she is on that fingertip. She's just so sweet. I just love them so much. Real quick, you've got to look this up later on when we're done. But they have tickle bees and this is in Oregon. And that's what the kids call them in the schoolyard. Yes, this is a schoolyard and they're little ground bees. <coughs> Excuse me. Most of our ground bees, um, they're only out for about two weeks. I just had a call just, I think it was this spring and a mom was concerned, you know, there's little bees underneath the swing set. I said, if you can wait two weeks, bring your kids over here and play in our swing sets because we've got mulch. So there's probably not gonna be any ground bees. Um, I said, they'll be all done. And the bees that are left are in the ground and you won't see them until next spring. Out for two weeks and they're gone again. But the um, an entomologist had moved into the area and he kept hearing about these tickle bees. He didn't know what they were talking about. So it's an Andrina species, which you can look that up if you want. But cute little stingless. We do have a lot of species that are native that are stingless. They don't have a stinger. They, they're busy. They don't have, they say, like, I ain't got no time for that. <laughs> so I don't need time for that. So they... They don't sting. So here's what their little mounds would look like in a schoolyard, um, maybe where you've got your softball, baseball, those types of fields. And here's the little gal right here. And you can see she's got some little bit of pollen kind of punched in right there, all kind of packed up. And she's got all over her little hairy little body. And a lot of our native bees are much hairier than um, honeybees. So they get up earlier in the morning than honeybees do. They can pollinate later in the evening than honeybees. Honeybees are, they're a cultivated crop. Uh, there was a scientist in one of the books that I read. Um, he said, if you think raising honeybees is saving or helping the native bees, he said, then you might as well raise chickens and say, hey, I'm helping the native birds. That speaks volumes to me. So, and anyway, the kids love it when these come out in their schoolyard. Um, and Sabine, it's a Sabine Elementary. And 
this is now their mascot. This has gone on for years now. And um, as the kids get older, they're like, yeah, I don't know what those are. But they said every year, the kindergartners, the new ones that come, they love them. And they get down there on their hands and knees and they watch them and they might pet them a little bit. And again, they're stingless. So anyway, got to keep moving. Just I just love, love, love our native bees when I got to know them. Carpenter bees, uh, they live in holes that they have drilled themselves. I know some of you guys already know this. <laughs> and here's what, uh, here's a cute little, her little head sticking out there she's coming back out to get she's got a lot of work to do to get uh pollen and nectar and she will make um a hole um, that she digs herself she can dig up to about two inches a day and you'll see the little shavings below it and once in a while um they do come back to old um holes or reuse them um they will clean them out first of course so you might see one hole and you might see maybe one or two females using that. Normally the guy that's buzzing around out here that annoys the daylights out of you, he's a male. Male bees and hornets and all that all over the world, no stingers. Same thing with the wasps. Females are the only ones that have them. Uh, we also have leaf cutter bees. I was excited when I found this out. See her little furry belly down here. I'm hoping you can see my little pointer. She's got, she will cut out a, a circle in the leaf of a plant. And when I found out about these, I took a run down the path and I checked our shrubs that were in leaf at the time. She'll come out a little bit later this spring, late spring, early summer. And it doesn't hurt the plant. They've evolved together. The leaf continues to photosynthesize, but she rolls that up and she'll find a hole and like a snag, like these dead trees I've got shown down here. And um, that's she'll roll that little leaf up and she'll start from the back of the hole. Um, specific beetles make these holes because they won't use just any diameter. They only use certain ranges. And then we have mason bees, the same thing. Look at her, look at how she's covered with pollen. Now this happens to be a tube that someone provided. You can get on Crown Bees website. I'll talk about that a little bit later, but um, they uh, are very helpful at getting you the native bee huts that you need, not these bamboo things, not these things that you buy in the stores and even some reputable companies. Um, let's see, okay. Oh, there's what the shrub can look like. I think it's pretty. Um, it happened to be on our spice bush. And of course it comes back every year. Oh, and here's the difference between a bumblebee and a carpenter bee. Real quick, bumblebees have shiny uh, abdomens um, all insects have head, thorax, and abdomen. And then the bumblebees, it's uh, furry, very hairy. Here's a bumblebee hive. Bumblebees, not all, but there's a lot of species that are social. You're not going to get 20 to 60 to 80,000 in a hive with, um, depending on how many supers they put on top for honey. You might get, whoops, sorry. You might get... Um, maybe up to 300 at the most. But she comes out in the spring. She digs her way out of the ground. She's been hibernating since last fall. She builds herself from wax from her own, underneath from her own body. She has these little sheets of wax that come out. She builds herself a little, I call them little nectar pots. So she goes and collects nectar and she fills these up. Brilliant. And so when you have a rainy day in the spring or a day that's, you know, the weather's not so good or maybe even for a few days, she's got food and she can just hang out for a while. So smart little gals, these things are amazing. And then what she does, um, she collects, she makes the wax, she has pollen and nectar, she makes like little bee bread, she puts it in these cells, she puts an egg in there. Depending on the species, they might just put one egg in there, they might put a few and they seal them up and then eventually she gets helpers as the summer goes on. This I just wanted to show you, this, is a, this happens to be a European honeybee making wax. They do the same thing when they make their um, comb. Um, and that was one of the reasons because they've been cultivated so long. They say one source said over 2000, I found another source most recently, I keep reading, um, said 9,000 years. I was like, wow. But anyway, I did the honeybee because that's the only photo I could find of. So I wanted you to see that wax coming. I just think that's remarkable. She produces that with her own body. And here's a little honeybee that's in trouble. Something happened. I don't know if she got into a pesticide, 
but the wax is coming out, it's coming out a whole bunch, and she's not doing too good. Okay, and now this is a nest filled with bumblebee workers. I think that these are little buff-tailed bumblebees. They're mostly found in Britain, but they're just, they're so cute. It was an awesome picture. Um, so you now you've got a queen here. She's got this many helpers. She doesn't have to leave the hive anymore. She can basically eat and lay her eggs and um, just kind of keep an eye on things, make sure everything's gonna go okay. One queen when they're social, and then you all the rest are females at this point. She's not laying any male eggs. Um, now later on, so when summer comes, then she starts laying eggs and the workers feed them and she gets the new queens for next year because she's not gonna live and all these gals that are here in this group they are not um, going to survive the winter. Everybody's going to die. Then um, late, late early, summer, early fall, she does produce males. And this is another thing you can look it up. It's so much more to say about this, but the genetics in bees uh, and hornets are very fascinating. When the female, she normally gets fertilized in the native bees, the fall before or late summer before she hibernates and then she hibernates then she wakes up and then she can start producing female workers and then when it's time to make males because all of her she's been laying fertilized eggs then she starts laying non-fertilized eggs so males don't have both sets of genes they only have one they're monoploid instead of diploid like we have two sets of genes, one from mom and one from dad. So this is the reason that they think ants do the same thing. They're in the same kind of hymenoptera. They, uh, they think that's why they get along so well because the, uh, the gals are more related to one another than they actually are to mom. And of course they're 100% related to dad, but he passed away last fall, so he's not there. <laughs> um, Okay, so, oh, there's a male, male bumblebee, much smaller than the females, and they're mating right there. And I was like, wow, she is big. It's like, whew. Uh, oh, yeah, right before winter. Okay. Oh, and our native bees, we have long tongue and short tongue bees. Um, so the species on where the, uh, let's see, let's use the arrow here. These are called Dutchman's breeches, and it's a native wildflower. They're absolutely gorgeous. And they need to be pollinated by long tongue bees. And this is a long tongue bumblebee. And it's because it has to be number one, strong enough to get its way into that flower. And number two, that tongue's gotta be able to reach that nectar that's up in these spurs right here. Um, so their tongues are like nine to 20 millimeters long. And if you look at that on a ruler, I'm 20 millimeters, I'm like, that's a lot of tongue for just the eeny beeny bee. So they do pollinate flowers that have deeper throats. Then you have your short tongues. Here's a cute little, um, I think this is a, a Colette bee. And you can see the flowers are more wide open and the nectar is really kind of there for everybody. Um, and so these short tongues, they cannot pollinate these um, deep, deeper flowers. Oh, shoot. Oh, poo. Um, so anyway, what I was gonna tell you is real quick, um, so I thought, when I read that, I thought, oh my gosh, wouldn't that be fun? What if human beings were long-tongued? And so I did a little math, a little calculating, and I looked up, you know, the average height of a human and the average length of a tongue. And uh, the average human tongue is about three inches, give or take a few tenths. Um, average height is 5'9". So I did some calculations, and our tongue would be 21 and a half times longer than it is now compared to the long tongue bee, or it would be 69 inches or five and a half feet long. <laughs> I was like, whoa. <laughs> uh, they've got, uh, yeah, they've got that guy in Kiss Bee, don't they? Gene Simmons. Some bees are nectar robbers. Um, again, they're very smart. These ladies are very resourceful. Um, you've got a, Carpenter bee on the left, and she is uh, slicing into that flower because she's too big to get in there. And she, maybe this is the, the closest nectar she can find. A lot of our native bees will not fly super far away from their nests that they have created. Whereas honeybees, because they've been cultivated for so long, they're you know an ag crop. 
Um, they can fly at four miles. I've heard sometimes five. That's kind of pushing it even for them. But when you've got 60,000 members in your hive, if you lose a few, it's not the end of the world. Um, here's another smaller bee that um, it probably using somebody else's, probably a carpenter bee where they um, rob the nectar there. And here, do you guys like blueberries? This is where uh, carpenter bees, they couldn't get in there, um, those bigger ones. And <laughs> they robbed the nectar from the blueberry, which is cheating because they're getting the nectar, but they're not getting that pollen from flower to flower. But blueberry bees, they won't use that. They're like, nah, I'm going in. And so they go in and things get pollinated. Um, there's a difference between social bees and solitary bees. Um, basically the big thing, and I'll hit this really quick and move on. Social bees, you've got one queen and you've got a lot of helpers, female workers. Um, so they're there to defend the hive. So the queen, she has a stinger. She, she doesn't have to use it very often, if at all, because, and the workers uh, in honeybees and uh, like hornets, you've got so many that they can, they can get pretty nasty, uh, but they're defending the hive. They're not trying to be mean. Um, in the solitary, every female's a queen. There really isn't a hive to defend because most of them are by themselves. Well, I mean, solitary, they are by themselves. And so she owns and maintains her own hole that she's mostly, like we said, are, are ground um, dwellers. And they're much more gentle. Um, they can sting. It's normally not that big of a deal. I've picked up, used to pick up some of the native bees around here. They're so cute. And the kids get so excited. And oh gosh, here we go again. I got to watch this little um, there. Okay, so real quick. U.S. wild bees, um, this is an older map. Should have put the date on them, apologize for that. Um, basically your areas of red, um, you've got your cropland areas. Look at over here in California, this is all your almonds pretty much. Look at Indiana. And um, basically it's showing where um, <coughs> you've got your dependency for your crops and then you've got your bee abundance. This is a little bit better map. Yellow's not good. Um, mean of bee abundance. And notice how that follows the uh, Mississippi River and all right in through there. It's like they're lacking in bees. And over here where the almonds are, it's like, hmm, wonder why they're lacking bees. Well, okay, people take up a lot of room. Um, buildings, shopping centers, parking lots, but it's got to be more than that. I picked out one pesticide, just glyphosate, and there are hundreds that are used on crops, not just one, and over the years. And this is, of course, you can see it's, it's outdated. It's 2017, but estimated use on agriland in pounds per square mile. And look at how dark we are and look at how dark it is following the Mississippi River. That's a lot of pesticides. It's no wonder the bees are in trouble there. I mean, you can't find them. One of the ones that we're missing that we know of in Indiana is the rusty patch. Um, cute little bumblebee. Oh, I wanted to show, oh, real quick, talk about the stingers, because um, that's always first and foremost, especially in a kid's mind, but a lot of adults too. Um, if I walk in your neighborhood and I'm staying to the sidewalks or the curb, I don't, you know, don't know if you have sidewalks in your neighborhood or not. You probably won't even pay any attention like, oh, there's, there's a lady walking by or whatever. But if I start walking on your lawn, you're going to start looking at me like, what the heck? And then if I start picking up something or leaning on the side of your house or your car, you're like, all right, that's it. Okay. Well, that's what happens with social bees is, and even sometimes solitary, you know, you get too close, they get nervous. The social can have a choice to get nervous a lot uh, faster and be a lot more mean because there's more, more bodies to come after you. So real quick, the European honeybee, which is the honeybees that we have all over. Some people call it the Western honeybee, Apis mellifera or mellifera, depending how you want to pronounce it. She's the only one, the, they are the only ones that have the barbed stingers. So when they sting, they can only sting you once, but it's gonna stay inside and it will continue to pump the venom. And a lot of times those are the ones that people tend to have a little more of a chance to have allergic reaction to. 
Um, our native bees, the ones that do have stingers, like, like we've talked about, most of them are solitary. She hasn't got time. And, you know, if, if you smush her, maybe. There are other bees that make honey too in this world, not just European Apis mellifera honeybees. Um, South America, some Central America uh, countries have these. And this is just showing you how they keep them, their native bees, and they took the top off the hive here. You can kind of take away right here. Just the coolest thing ever. Um, when they opened it up, look at that spiral and look at all, they're so brilliant, all the little nectar pots. So, and you can see it right in a lot of places, the gals are using them because that's a lot of work, you know, to fly around and go up so you can do your work, go over, get a little bit of food and then come back and do your work. So brilliant. Um, this is a honey that is found in South America um, from their native uh, bees that they have. These bees are, uh, they're Meliponia bees, um, different species. This stuff will go for, if I remember right, 50 bucks. And that's 250 grams, which I think is about a quart. Yeah, here we go. And, oh, Brazil. And what's happening is kind of sad. Um, they are, they have been losing some of their native pollinators because they've been asking the beekeepers to, um, they're saying, well, you know what? We don't want your honey. It tastes different. Well, of course it's going to taste different. They have different flowers, different flora, phonics there. So they said, we want you to do these European bees. We'll pay you more. And, um, you know, just forget about these others. And of course, because they've been cultivated for over 9,000 years, of course, they're going to make extra honey because that's what they, you know, they've been cultivating them to do. You should see the corn, um, long story short, that they used to have when they first started. It was a, teosinte was the plant down in Central America and it pff, barely anything, but the native, the natives down there were really, again, really smart. The Aztecs, Incas, you've heard all about them. They were cross pollinating and as the years, the decades, the centuries went by, they started to get a bigger and bigger. And then of course today we have our GMO corn all over the place, so. But kind of cool, this is, I like people to know and I think it is sad because as Brazil and some of these other countries are losing um, their native pollinators out to uh, the non-native honeybee, um, they're losing their wildflowers as well. And we're ha that's happening here too. Cause like I said, they can't all um, pollinate. Hey Holly, we have about 15 minutes left this evening. Okay, I will have to really, really step this up. Okay, so real quick, spring mason bees, they are the perfect pollinators. Um, you could see her pollen is all over. Honeybees, they pack it tight and that's not gonna come off and pollinate anything. One of our native mason bees can pollinate 12 pounds of cherries and she'll do it for free. You don't have to have a, you don't have to be a beekeeper heifer. It takes 60 honeybees to do that. Um, here's another mason, 250 mason bees can pollinate an acre of apple trees. It would take 10 to 250,000 honeybees to do the same work. They're not efficient pollinators at all. Um, the males normally, that's all this is, is they hatch out first um, in the spring. And they kind of, some wait right there. Some will go hang out on a flower like guys at the bar waiting for the gals to come out. <laughs> so uh, we have cuckoo bees. And these are bees that, is, um, yeah, we have cowbirds. It's named after the bird in England. And this is our parasitic bird, the brown-headed cowbird. Cuckoo bees have very strong jaws. They tend to look like the species that they um, parasitize. And she'll go in the nest and she'll smell and look a lot like the, the bees that she's parasitizing. Here's another one, it looks a lot like a bumblebee, but it's not, it's a cuckoo bee. And she could be right there and we would, we would I wouldn't even know which one she was. Um, biggest and smallest bee, that's Perdita. This is um, Carpenter. All bees have these uh, two large compound eyes and they have three acelli. So they really have five eyes, that's really, really cool. And of course, the bigger the bee, and the little tiny Perdita, she's so stinking cute. And she's gonna, of course, pollinate teenier, tinier flowers. Buzz pollination, honeybees can't do it, but bumblebees can. Um, and what happens is um, making a flower with all the different parts and eventually the fruit is very expensive energy-wise. So the uh, native bumblebee, she can get in there and 
the male part of these plants, like tomatoes, potatoes, eggplant, etc., um, they hold on to their pollen. Well, the, the, the female bumblebee, she comes in there, she wraps herself around, as you can see in these photos, and she buzzes, bzzz, and you need to look that up later on because it's so cool, and it makes the sound. That's why it's called buzz pollination. Well, what happens is, is that the pollen is shaken out. She is electrically charged, so it comes back and it sticks to her. Brilliant, brilliant stuff. There's a native wildflower that's blooming in some of our state parks and natural areas. Shooting star has to be buzz pollinated. Don't have bumblebees, we're gonna lose the flower. There's our little, there's our little, um, that was our blueberry bees. Wasp jackets, uh, yellow jackets, hornets, they are also pollinators. Um, I'll have to go through this really quick. I'm sorry, I just have so much cool stuff, but let me keep going here. Clickety, clickety, click. Wasps, I'll talk about this too. Wasps, um, the potter's wasp makes a pot and she'll get a caterpillar and stun it. This gal right here, our organ pipe mud dauber, she'll stun spiders of all kinds. Um, and they're alive in there. There's when it's sealed off. When you see the hole in this, or if you see the hole in the sides of this, then you know, here's different wasps on different native wildflowers. This is our largest wasp. It's our cicada killer. Keep your eye out for them this summer. We've got our brood X that's gonna come out. And then we have our regular cicadas. Um, and she has to be big because look at how big that cicada is. They're huge. And this is the, the typically this is the annual one. Um, <clears throat> the ones that we'll see from Brodex are black with red eyes. This is our smallest wasp, little fairy. Sometimes I see these in the yard and this is so cute because it looks like this little white little fluff just kind of just floating by. So it kind of made me think about, um, oh, real quick, <clears throat> because bees nest in the ground, okay, what's the difference between uh, yellow jacket wasps and native bees? Yellow jackets, they're, they're social, so you're going to see a bunch of them coming and going, coming and going, and some will wait here and guard. This over here, if it's native bee, you only see one gal, maybe two coming and going, and that's it. And that was just looking on the inside. Wasps, in the, according to the fossil record, came first. Um, you've seen this before. By the time you see this, these are little wasp uh, pupas that will come out of there. And that's the end of that tomato hornworm. It's not going to make any more damage. And here's a wasp eating a fly. So for every pest um, you've got, you've got a wasp that goes after that pest and will eat it. Butterflies, pollinators, 700, over, 20, over 725 species in North America. Um, north of Mexico, they taste with their feet. Um, these are just different butterflies. That's, a, that's your wild columbine. If your columbine's a different color, it's not the native one. Butterflies and all these, these bees, et cetera, they see an ultraviolet. So like we see this swallowtail like this, this is how they see one another in ultraviolet. I can't imagine flying around all day and looking at that. The Cleo butterfly and the flower, this is how they see each other. This is how they see the flowers. And this was this one down here, same thing. It's amazing. So what happens is, here's your black eyed Susan here. Here's how the pollinators see it. This dark area says, this is where the nectar's at. So they don't have to waste a lot of time. Because again, <clears throat> so many of these gals are working alone. You've got your penstemons over here where you've got your pollinator guides, <clears throat> floral guides that said, hey, this, you know, follow this, this is where it's at. This is a horse chestnut, technically not native to Indiana, but this is another thing a lot of flowers do. The ones that are yellow, they're saying, hey, we've got nectar. We haven't been pollinated yet. Sometimes a flower will lose the nectar for a few hours and get more until it gets pollinated. The rest of these flowers, stop. I don't have any more nectar. Don't waste your time. That is awesome. And this is a bee balm in UV light. Oh, this is just a comic that... <laughs> That's what the bee sees, and that's a beekeeper. Oh, whoops, anyway. Moths are pollinators. <clears throat> this is a cute little yucca moth. She can't live without the yucca plant. The yucca plant can't live without her. This is our May apple. Do you see our little slant lined moth right here? Very cute. Uh, flies are pollinators. They tend to go after flowers that are kind of stinky, and you can tell it's a fly. Diptera, two, two wings instead of four. Um, they also hold them out like this. Their eyeballs are closer together. And look at the antenna. They're teeny, weeny, tiny antenna. 
That's a seraphid fly. Sure looks like a bee or a hornet to me. They call them bee mimics when they look like bees. Mosquitoes are pollinators. I hate mosquitoes. And now I have a reason to kind of sort of maybe kind of like them okay. But here's blunt leaf orchid. They do pollinate because again, nectar is the energy drink of the insect world. And so they are going to go in and get nectar and they're going to spread some pollen around. Bats. Now, not real quick here, not Indiana bats. Ours are insect eaters. These bats are more in the Southwest and Central America and South America. Um, you can see the little face in there and you see this guy's tongue right here. They hover over these flowers. Look at his cute little face, a little leaf nose bat, a little tongue sticking out I'm saying, hey guys. And I always ask the crowd, of course, I can't do that now, but I say, what do you think he's pollinating? Bananas. And this is what our bananas look like. This is a native banana. So this is how much we've, we've modified this one. Uh, less seeds, more sugar, um, and of course, a lot bigger. <clears throat> and this is why bats matter. And you could find this easily at batcon.org. Um, they like flowers that open at night. They like flowers that are full of nectar. Um, that kind of have a fermenty fruit-like odor. These are mangoes. This is, uh, this is a plant where um, we get tequila from. They get to the plant before they let it bloom. Some people know it as a century plant. Once it blooms, that's the end of the plant. Humongous tall blooms on these things. But when they want tequila, they grow this like on a farm and they cut all these things off. They split this guy open, they boil it down and then you get your alcoholic beverages. Um, this was a greenhouse that was growing one of these that decided it was time. And uh, they had to modify the roof to say the least. <laughs> Pretty remarkable. Kind of, it's in the asparagus family, go figure. Ants are pollinators. Beetles are pollinators. Beetles are also another one, stinky, stinky flowers. Um, these flowers are not in our country, but they smell really bad. This one over here where the kids are hides underneath the ground for five years before it even, you even know it's there. And this one, sometimes greenhouses will have, and people will line up and walk through to smell that stinky flower. We have stinky. Um, our skunk cabbage, it already has bloomed. So this is what we have left of the leaves. Uh, flies, have come, some of the first ones out. Um, Gar um, not garlic, um, ginger, wild ginger. These are the flowers hidden underneath those heart-shaped leaves that last all summer. We have lots of birds. Typically ours is just the ruby throat. There's a female, I think here and here. This is our native honeysuckle, which we almost never see. This is cardinal flower. There's a lot of these are from other countries. Oh, here's another one, trumpet flower. That's, that is native. Uh, I love it. Um, Sometimes the birds will rob the flowers, snails and slugs. Go to the snailwrangler.com. Oh my God, you will love it. But they have found that's a trillium. We have native trilliums. Mammals, other than bats. Our largest pollinator is this guy right here, uh, ringtail uh, lemur. These are um, on Australia, cute little tiny things. And this one, uh, oh shoot. Sugar, oh, I can't think of the name of it. I think they're so cute, they're little, little possum. Um, the lemurs pollinate these traveler's palms. If you guys have ever watched the shows of your little kids or your grandkids and the traveler's palm, the flowers, look at those seed pods. This is a seed, I've never, that blue is gorgeous. And here's the pollinator. This guy is the only one that's strong enough that when that thing is flowering to get his hands in there, his opposable thumb, pry it open, stick his snoot in, lap up all the nectar, and then he gets a face full of pollen and goes to the next one. Reptiles are pollinators. A lot of these are on the uh, Mortis Islands, so we don't have those here. Again, remarkable, it's amazing. I'll uh, keep going. So real quick, how can you be friendly? <laughs> plant native plants, please, please plant native plants. Um, this is just one book. There'll be a lot of them that'll be coming on here. Um, make sure when you're planting native plants that you get some that bloom uh, early, mid, late spring, early, mid, late summer, and fall. Um, a little mud is helpful if you have some of that around. A little bare ground's okay, like under the swing set or maybe an area in your garden that's in the back. Um, a little water doesn't hurt. Uh, another great book, if you guys haven't heard of Doug Tallamy, oh my gosh. Um, 
don't use these. These are bamboo. Don't use those. This is this is a good one because these things will break open. And again, go to crown bees. Um, when you get dead stalks, when your flowers are done, don't. I mean, if you have to cut them down, cut them to as close to the ground as you can and stack them somewhere. Don't burn them because there are a lot of native pollinators that use the hollow stems to overwinter inside. Um, it's neat to leave them up and just watch the snow sit or don't use insecticides. Oh my gosh. Um, it's crazy. Um, one of the worst ones are neonicotinoids. You can read about those. Think about this 999 out of every thousand insects is actually beneficial or harmless. There's another, that's Doug Tellamy's newest book. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Um, there's crown bees. Create and protect bee nest sites. This is a good one because it stacks and you can clean it. Um, yeah, don't use tin cans, don't use bamboo, don't use uh, plastic. Spread the word. This is a great book for adults and kids. This is where Doug and Rick Dark got together and people said, well, I want natives in my yard, but I want my yard landscape. Like they're like, we get it, cool. And this book is brilliant, just brilliant. Um, and again, there's some great stories in all of these books that they tell um, that what makes a difference. Um, oh, if you really, really, really want to raise native bees, just do your homework, okay? It's expensive. These guys, they're basically, they're free. And this is another little, little mega chile. <laughs> this is a great one to help identify your bees in your backyard. Great book. Um, politics. Uh, pollinator protection plan, um, write to your local council, political representatives, ask them when they're planning in your neighborhood. Can we have more, you know, native bee friendly plants and not these god awful, my kids call them poop trees, calorie pears. Um, eat organic. When you spend your cash, you're casting votes. And I understand I'm not wealthy myself as far as money goes. And um, I do understand that everything organic can be a little expensive. So there's a great, um, all you have to do is type in, oh, it's, um, it's like the worst top 10 worst things to eat. Um, and try to get those in organic. And I know one of them's apples, one of them's strawberries, because my husband loves strawberries. Um, can't think of what it's called right now, but you'll find it. The, um, and the so dirty, we, it's the dirty dozen. Thank you. Thank you. That's it. The dirty dozen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, that is awesome. So yeah, so pick a few things, maybe not everything, but pick a few things. Those are the worst. Here's another great book. Um, Xerxes website with, a, with an X is a great. This is wonderful too. Uh, when you're planning your garden, think like a pollinator. Go native. Be showy. Don't put one flower here and one flower here. You got to plant them kind of, you know, they like, they're like us, they like to be social. Uh, chemical free, sunny, homey, be aware, be friendly, be a little messy, doesn't have to be totally, be diverse, like we talked about, um, be gentle and be patient. Be end. <laughs> Thank you so much to Holly for that wonderful presentation. I know I certainly learned a ton and we do have some great questions here okay. from um, our audience in chat. And Shannon would like to know what specific flowers can we plant to help our native bees? Mm. Well, a lot, <laughs> a lot, a lot. One thing that will help is um, we here uh, several years ago, started to put our money where our mouth is here at Hamilton County Parks and Rec. And we here at the Cool Creek Nature Center, we right now are selling native trees and native shrubs. We can't sell all the different ones. I'll tell you where we buy from. We buy from Woody Warehouse. Um, they might be a little bit more expensive than getting off of us because we're not in it for the money. We're in it to get the native plants out there and to replace your nasty Bradford and calorie pears. Um, Oh, there are just so many, and I'm not sure where to start. Um, also, a good resource, a lot of those books I just showed you, and um, like the beef, uh, oh, what am I thinking? There's um, a wildflower catalog that I get all the time. A lot of us get it here, and it, not, it goes through the scientific name, the common name, what it needs for light and moisture, um, 
and oh, and if you live in Hamilton County, guess what, guys? We have Hamilton County Soil and Water, and you can call them. And I'm not sure if Claire does this, Claire Lane, but there's someone there that does um, backyard conservation, and they will come out for free. They'll take a look at your yard and you can kind of let them know like, yeah, this gets wet and it stays wet or this gets wet, but it dries up after yada, yada. This is shade, this is sun. And they will for free drop, uh, drop plans and um, help you pick out what you'd like to plant there. And then if you're somebody that wants to get it all done at once, you know, you're, well, you'll still have to be patient because some of the things aren't available right now because springs, the early spring's almost gone. But anyway, you'll, you'll have a plan that you can use that's yours and you could do it over a series of a few years or a lot of years or, you know, a couple of years, get it done quickly so things start to fill in. So there's, yeah, there is a lot. We are going to get our native, uh, we call them Forbes, native wildflowers, uh, some ferns, Sedge and some native grasses, they'll come in middle of May. Watch our webs, our Facebook, sorry, our Facebook, our um, Cool Creek Nature Center Facebook. And I think it's also our Hamilton County Facebook as well, Parks and Rec. So keep an eye out and you see those come in. And we love to help when you guys come in and ask questions. And we give you sheets about the plants that you get. And again, we sell them at cost. Those we get from Cardno. The only problem with Cardno is that they are awesome but they only want to sell um, big, big lots of plants, um, like, you know, several hundred dollars, a lot of plants. And if you have a big yard, that's great. But if you don't, that's like, whoa, wait a minute, I don't need that many. So that's why it's great for us. We buy from them in bulk and we can sell them individually and you can come pick out what you want. Well, that's very helpful. We've added some of those links in the chat. And Jennifer, this is our last question. If anyone else has a question, if you'd like to type that in the chat or you can wait until we're finished with this question wrapping up. This is a question about dandelions for Holly. And Jennifer wants to know, will getting rid of the dandelions in my yard hurt the local bees? And if so, what can I plant to help them? Ooh, I have dandelions in my yard and I have wild violets and it's gorgeous right now. It's purple and yellow, like bright purple and bright yellow, and the violets are native. Dandelions, um, like Queen Anne's Lace, um, we do have some flowers in this country that will probably never go away. So learn to love them. I call my yard a salad bowl. Um, when my husband mows, it you can't tell it any different than my neighbor when she used to spray all the time the pesticides and ironically they both passed of cancer um i don't know if it was spray or not but i couldn't let the kids outside either but we've never sprayed our yard we have more wildlife in our yard and i just live in town in westfield um you can just leave them if you don't mind them just leave them because they're just they they do use them they do the native and the rabbits will eat them and they won't eat you less likely to eat i should say your garden plants that you put in um they'll eat the dandelions it's fun to watch them too they'll get it near the very bottom of the rosette of leaves and they'll pick it off and then they'll like chump 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 it's <laughs> like i've never seen anybody you know we eat noodles are kind of you know floppy but these things are sticking out and they're like oh my God, it's funny um Shade, I know a really good one for shade is uh, wild ginger. That's a great one because the leaves stay all summer. I've got a little bit of that in my yard. Um, I actually rescued that from a site that was going to become a neighborhood. Um, there's, yeah, there are some nurseries out there. The thing about us is that we start, we've already started and we won't end until the end of October. So we'll, we'll keep selling. And as the uh, season goes on, we'll, it'll change what we have. Um, but yeah, <laughs> Illinois Wildflower is a good website to look up your natives because they're just right next door to us. They're not that different. What they have native, we have native here. Um, I wish I could remember the name of that catalog because they'll give you a free catalog. They're just awesome. I ordered some stuff from them this spring and I cannot think of the name. I apologize. Holly, is it Wild Seed? No, I'm trying to think. It's not Minnesota wildflower. It's, um, gosh, I hate that. I can't remember that. 
Um, we'll, we'll look for it, and then when we yeah. email the recording link out to everyone who registered and attended for today, we'll make sure to include that information. Okay, definitely. Perfect, perfect. But yeah, there's so many cool websites. Oh, it's amazing. And so much information. So many brochures. Um, uh, there's a great one about bees in your lawns. And I can get you that list that you can email out to everyone that's interested. Um, I normally have a stack of brochures, but I was told, and I admire this, that um, they're trying to go paper free at uh, Carmel Library. So I got to pull a list together um, and give that to them and then they can um, send it out to you guys and you can look up whatever you want to your heart's delight. All right, let's see here. There we go. Ooh. All right, if we have any last questions before we wrap up this evening, give people a moment. I will thank you so much again to Holly this evening for joining us for that fantastic presentation. Amy says thank you for the great information as well in chat. Jennifer says thank you, Holly. Um, we will send an email out with more information, including the recording from this evening's program, in case you'd like to watch that again or share it with anyone. Um, please keep an eye on the library's website for more information on future um, events in person and online. And we'll see you next time. Thank you so much. I appreciate it.